he says, uh, uh, my sister's name is Ava, which is popular now, but wasn't back in the day. Yeah. And I was like, just, I like to have it pretty close to his Okay. Very warm. glamorous name. Though. I know. It's, it's like, Ava's a nice name. I was like, why did you, Lisa, so like. I was like, pissed. I felt like you me really too. want me to be a trashy cheerleader. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Are you a comedian? No. No? Not You're intentionally, she isn't. No. I uh, just, I think I just talk a lot. <laughs> okay, hold on. Wait. All right. Good. Say something. Uh, something. <laughs> Good enough. Lisa D. Uh, something. <laughs> Are you a comedian? No. <laughs> I wish I was funny like Gilda, though. Uh, or like everybody funny does. people. Funny people are so great. We had a screening at Friars Club last night. Mm-hmm. I was, yeah. How was, how was Jackie Mason? No, uh, he's probably not even ghost. allowed in there. <laughs> no. Wait, you is know, he still alive? He, oh, very much. His hair, his hair is alive. Oh, really? Uh, I don't his know about that. Is <laughs> alive. <laughs> that is a Shonda. <laughs> <laughs> he is a bastard, I hear. But really? but, but you know, you got to give him. Well, I hear he's a real yeah, and he's a real arch. He's a real Trump Trump supporter yes. too. I hear. So anyway, we don't have to go on. I just want to lay down a, uh, the groundwork here, or at least the uh, the setting, which is that uh, we I'm, I'm flanked by two wonderful Lisas. One is uh, Lisa Rossman, who is my official co-host today, because you are a real Radner... Aficionado. Aficionado and, and file. Yeah, P- zealot, P- maybe. P-H. Zealot, zealot. zealot. Zealously so. And then the director of a new documentary called Love Gilda, Lisa Dapolito. Did I pronounce that correctly? Yeah. Very in, a, in a very How sophisticated way. I like the way you <laughs> did it. Diapolito. Yeah. <laughs> hey, you're from a nice Italian family. Where, where, where are you from? Um, from Greenwich way. Village, from where Bleecker Street, oh, the oh. loudest is block in, in the New York UK? City. Wow. Yes. If you're facing the street, yes, yeah, you're right. Yeah, that was what my bedroom growing up was, wow. on Bleecker between Sullivan and McDougal. That is hardcore village. So you guys are village. both old school New Yorkers. Where are you from? I'm from New York, but I grew up in the, on the mean streets of Forest Hills. Oh, okay. But my, my parents moved to the village in the 80s. They oh, moved really? To, yeah, they sold the house and moved to uh, for, uh, the village. They lived on Fifth Avenue, 10th Street. Talk about... That's great. posh. Mm-hmm. That's posh. It, yeah. It was, but they had a very, you know, non-posh lifestyle and apartment, but it was totally, everybody loved it. It was fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you, so you, okay, so Lisa, I invited you again because you were such a huge lover of Gilda. Mm-hmm. And you were, of course, a, a media and film person in your own right. But you, you started saying something when I cut you off because I well, didn't... Well, I've been doing a deep dive on Gilda for yeah. um, the last two or three months. Be, and I've been simultaneously trying to figure out why. You know, I, I read her own biography, uh, memoir, It's Always Something, which a lot of it is about her cancer struggle. And Alan Zweibel, who is one of the producers of this, I- executive producer or producer? Uh, executive producer. Um, fantastic man unto his own right, you yeah. know. Uh, was one of the first writers for SNL, Gary Shandling, and he right. wrote a oh, book uh, about his relationship with Gilda that's just a series of their conversations, which basically could not be more endearing. It's a bunny bunny. Yeah, yeah bunny bunny. Thanks it's to you, I Fantastic. Yeah. So I've been reading all this stuff and watching her insanely beautiful work on SNL, and then I, someone was like, dude, you have to make sure you go see the doc. And I was so moved by it because I felt like you captured the missing part of all of these other documentations of Gilda. And it also clarified for me why I love her so much, which is that nobody else was so guileless, but so funny. Like, that combination, even Lucy, you know, had more of an edge to her than Gilda. Yeah, I mean, it's hard. I never met Gilda. So I, I constructed the film on who I think Gilda was based on all the conversations of her friends. So I had Alan and Robin and Gilda's brother Michael and Gilda's best friend. So I had, I was really lucky. I could call any of them, email any of them and say, what did Gilda do? What was her favorite drink? What was her favorite color? Like, I, I tried to build who I thought Gilda would be based on what they w- were saying. And also, I had all this amazing archival m- material that no one had ever seen before. Mm-hmm. Her audio um, recordings, her journals, her private writings, her short stories. Like, it really gave me an amazing insight into into who I thought she, who I think she is. I like that she's such an obvious subject for a documentary yet it did never it uh, i don't know what did you have any information that anybody else started a project like this because she's she's so worth focusing on for a film and you know just the her important place in the history of contemporary comedy and just as a uh, spirit you know people should know who she is and uh 
Uh, so I, I don't know. Was it, do you well, do you know if anybody else had tried to make a documentary? About there it? were um, TV documentaries. There's mm. like E, the Hollywood Story. Okay. Well, <laughs> there was, I have one of those um, in a, you know some. They, uh, uh, well, there's like three or four about. of those. So when I started making the film, and I would talk to people, they would be like, "Well, her story was done before," or nobody knows. I mean, this yeah. really has come up a lot at the beginning. Well, no, no, no one knows who Gilda Radner is anymore. And that really came up, and why is her story relevant? Yeah. And that was, that was a challenge. Hmm. I, I obviously have an opinion about this, but why do you think her story was so relevant? Like, what drove you to the project? Well, oh. I started doing fundraising videos for Gilda's Club in New York City mm-hmm. on oh. um, Houston Street. Right, right next to the film forum. Yeah. yeah, yeah that's yeah. where all the film people know uh, about <laughs> it. Like, Gilda's true. Club. <laughs> right. I saw that after Orson Welles. Yeah. yeah. That's how you, what's, what's the institution next to film forum? And then you know if they answer correctly that... Uh, the Red Door. Yeah. yeah. You have to talk yeah. about the Red Door. And... Um, then when I started doing these um, videos, I read her book. I had never read her book before. It's always something. It's always something. And then I would interview members of Gilda's Club, and they would talk about Gilda because their cancer journey was Gilda's cancer journey. Mm-hmm. So I just thought her legacy, as I started now, then I'm on the Internet every night, and I'm reading all these amazing comedians who were inspired by Gilda, and she's on the best, always on the best list of best female comedians best right. snl cast members i had a google alert where there's always somebody quoting never mind or it's always something like you know just in her re- catchphrases right yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. and i just thought her legacy was so unique because it's not just her her place in comedy it's also her place as an inspiration to people living with cancer yep. so it's like a twofold yes. right um a twofold legacy yeah uh And she just, I mean, it's funny. She had this really sweet tenaciousness, which makes her such a perfect, I don't don't know what the respectful term would be, but like a perfect person for other people to look to when they have a cancer struggle, you know, because so much, I feel like you really captured this beautifully in the doc too, that she was determined to figure out how to do this as herself. How essentially not just live with cancer, but at a certain point die with cancer with, you know, with the same sense of humor that somehow didn't feel dissociative you know how a lot of times when people are funny you feel like they're avoiding something in a in this massive way but with her it was like she was somehow getting to the core of the pain of of being vulnerable and alive but in a really funny way well it's interesting because you know you ask people well what was Gilda like and they say funny and you're like okay well obviously she's funny because <laughs> she's a comedian well yeah, but go ahead but then I um, started having, um, when I started finding these audio cassettes that she had recorded for her book, It's Always Something, the way she tells a story is really funny. Mm-hmm. Like, everything about her is funny. The like, way she screws up her mouth is funny. Yeah. You know? Like, she does this little purse of her mouth that goes to the left, oh, and you're right. like, she's hilarious. Yeah. That's that face that she did with uh, Lisa, her character. Uh, Lisa Lupner. Li- Lisa Lupner, yeah. Uh, I was going to say... Well, a lot of people turn off the comedy. I don't know. Some people it might even be intentional where they, when they're not on the stage, they're, you know, in their real life, quote unquote, that they're serious. You know, it's this whole thing. It, it, it appears with her, it didn't, it wasn't even an issue. It didn't matter. She was just Gilda, you mm-hmm. know. I was thinking on the way over uh, to meet you, Lisa uh, Rossman, that uh, we had a little lunch, that... That year, the first year especially when Chevy was on the show, because I just saw him on um, Norm MacDonald, foot and mouth MacDonald. Anyway, he, 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 he was on there, and it was, he was so gracious. Uh, it was like a new Chevy. It was like, you know, he, he just seemed much more normal than ever. And uh, he was talking about Gilda lovingly. And I, it's interesting because, you know, he didn't get along. Chevy didn't get along with, uh, with Bill Murray. That or Belushi. Or, 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 that way, I guess he. They, they were two ships that passed, but and Belushi infamously, were, uh, and the and uh, there was so much male testosterone there, that someone like Jane Curtin and Lorraine Newman clearly didn't have a, a real chance of getting a lot of a visibility. But Gilda, just through this this personality, Lisa, you're describing, um, was able to. And her brilliance, I well, guess. Well, she also worked with them longer. Like, she had gone all the way back Five to years. National Lampoon, right? Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah she was. True. She did that crazy rock but, review show with oh those God. boys. So they all knew each other. But she, she says in, the docu- in, in your documentary, Lisa Diapolito, that uh, 
she was just like the woman yeah. for the first the bunch of the years. The, the girl in yeah. the show. Right, the girl but in the show. I think that was, but Gilda just loved performing and she loved being with people. And I think it was, she could hold her own with all these guys. So in her personal life, she struggled with many of her issues like her eating her, disorder, her oh, self-image. Right. She never felt beautiful. But as a performer, she was 100% confident. Yeah. Like you could see it in her performance. She just goes for it. And right. I think the guys really respected her They for must that. have, right? And she did have relationships with, <laughs> with a number of them, yeah. too, and romantic. Then, and then she was friends with them afterwards. Which so. is That's also really, really telling, yeah. right? There was very no true. drama. Yeah, you're very true. What does that mean to you? What do you think that means? Because I'm not a woman. <laughs> and I it's know that I struggle with, I've always struggled. Like I want to be friends with my exes, but I also want to... You know, well, think about what's lesson, in you know. Zweibel's memoir, right? About his relationship with her. There's yeah. a, one of the interesting parts of that book is that they were they sort of circled around dating. You get the sense that they schnogged. They might have even at some point actually slept together. You can't quite tell, but yeah, they, they sort of like walk into a romantic relationship and walk back out. And it seems like from that story that Gilda worked very hard to preserve what was good between them after the romantic portion didn't work out Mm -hmm. and there was something about that that made me feel like even sorrier that she had passed so young that she had such goodness to her Um, yeah I don't know Gilda had so many boyfriends (laughs) and and yeah and And was collecting husbands too yeah and some of them you know were the wrong guys yeah G Smith I mean come on who is he right for I'm sorry met him not a nice guy I I want to say one thing here and I apologize that we're kind of like I'm I don't even know if I was very articulate in my last comment about her trying to kind of figure out this non-aggressive pure a very pure uh, personality was able to rise to the top like you know just be able to navigate how to deal with all those guys on that show you know but, but don't so un- well. underestimate her because she was I also am, right? very yeah. yeah she was very driven okay yeah very driven very, driven. very hard working yeah. very intelligent very mm. astute I see. right so i don't think anything was going to stop her mm. because even like you'll see in the documentary if things aren't going her way she finds a way to turn any situation around and I think that also on another side note from what I've heard which is in the film is the writers loved writing for her because she always knew her lines she always knew her blocking and she put like a hundred percent into every one of her sketches pretty amazing where did you get all of the amazing audio that's Gilda in the movie some of it seems like it might have been from it's always something yeah it's a it's a uh, the audiobook version. Yeah, it's it's a, about twenty different audio res, uh, resources. Okay. So um, the original source was the um, audio that she had recorded for. It's always something in preparation for writing the book, but that was really extremely damaged. So we had to supplement with um, radio interviews. We found we found some journalists who had kept their tapes from wow. forty years ago, wow. like um, uh, these. Uh, Two people from the University of U, uh, U of M came and interviewed Gilda when she was on SNL and wrote an article. We found the article and they still had the tape. So, and, wow. and then we had to use It's Always Something, which I didn't really want to use because she recorded the book three weeks before she died. Mm. So that mm. she's reading and she's sent. So it's a mm. conglomeration wow. of all kinds of audio right. and then amazing audio people working together to try to make it sound like it's really Gilda you know from one source but yeah uh, I so appreciate that you did that because I feel like so often when you make these documentaries especially about women then you kind of <laughs> there'll be some other voice doing the voiceover and I'm like wow you are literally taking away her voice so it's yeah. amazing that you did that thank you because yeah. that was a struggle and and during the period uh, there were so many people who said we got to get an actress to read this and that we'll get somebody who sounds like Gilda or there's places that like we'll just have somebody record this. I was like, no, because it's not genuine. Like, I wanted her her voice. Um, that was the one thing I was adamant about. Um, is And it worked in the end, but everyone said it wouldn't work. But thanks to amazing editors. Yeah, you brought her back. Editor, you brought her back. T- yeah, my editors were great. The audio people, we had three weeks of audio rest. You know, we had lots of audio restoration and three weeks of a mix, so. Uh, we should mention right now that <laughs> Love Gilda, Lisa Diapolito's uh, documentary will be premiering theatrically this Friday, September 21st in New York and 
in uh, 50 cities throughout 50, the country. And 49 Yay! other cities. Yeah, For awesome. God's sake, that's ridiculously so large. you can go to um, www.lovegilda.com. Let me try to remember playing. that now. Love Gilda. Oh, okay. And it's going to be playing at a theater near you, near you. So go to lovegilda.com and find out where the theater is. And what a what a uh, appropriate and, and ambitious theatrical. And everybody will get to see their one of their favorite uh, com- comedians. And also maybe be introduced. So take your daughters and sons. And, mm. Because um, I when, when Gilda did her one-person show on Broadway, <laughs> just... I'm going to do a Broadway show, <laughs> and she does it, and it's an enormous success. Uh, I didn't get to go to that. I don't know why. I guess maybe I was just a little young, you know, where I wasn't going to take myself to this, and I was a little old, so my parents weren't taking me. But I did see in the paper or something that Gilda Radner was going to be signing copies of the the original soundtrack, whatever, the mm-hmm. soundtrack, the, or, record. Or the record, rather, because it's not a soundtrack. It's actually the, the show. It's just an audio version of it. And um, so I already had the album. <laughs> so I don't know. I was or maybe I was already on my way somewhere because I went to the store where she was doing a signing, and uh, and and uh, because I had an al- the album, it didn't occur to me to buy another copy. So I just I was got in line and I just grabbed a a, a bag like a record. What they had a vinyl albums then, and so the bags were made for vinyl. So it was big. So I got to the front, and she kind of gave me one of these funny looks, like, oh, this is one of those fans that don't buy my thing. I think I must have said I have a copy. But anyway, she was nice, and she signed her name. So I actually met her and got her a signature. Aww. So I have it somewhere, and I meant to get it, find it, and bring it, but I forgot to do Aww, it. My, that's so exciting. But I, so I'm the only one in this room who up. met her. Wow, that's Aww. sorry to lord I'm that over jealous. you guys. I am. <laughs> and would you have remember- had a moment with Would her. you have thought, like, when you were this young guy, that someday you would be doing this interview about her? It, 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 right then and there. I, 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 I meant to tell her that. <laughs> 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 this is my opportunity. I was uh, curious. Can I, I, yes. I'm sorry. I, I was I curious just to what tell that your biggest revelation was about her oh, upon great. making this documentary. Like, What was the thing that took you ba- aback the most or you never have expected? I think in her journals um, that she kept during Saturday Night Live, um, how lonely she felt. And how um, her eating disorder was really kicking in. Her loneliness was kicking in. Um, was that a thing that the pr- was that a pressure too from the from the media at the time I uh, think to so. look skinny and to, or was that s- well, she, was she born, had been ch- she, she had, had been, been overweight, struggling with her weight as a child. You can see that. And the, we're it talking comes about up the seventies too, yeah. and and also Saturday Night Live. It was a different time, mm, and right. there were all rock bands on the show and beautiful models at the party afterwards. And I think Gilda just felt um, so alone. Right. And if you look, so that revelation, and then also watching the five years of SNL in a row looking at season four and seeing how skinny she is you nailed that i mean i hadn't really ever put together that she looks so she looks almost as gaunt as lorraine newman by that season Mm -hmm. you know and i it's i don't think anyone had put the lens on it the way that you did before i was really surprised yeah definitely noticed that back then even as a kid watching that show that these women are really skinny you know they don't look good every i mean but look at the emmys last night I didn't. Of, yeah, it's well, Michigan. Yeah, That's would, what my grandmother yeah. would say. <laughs> <laughs> well, or look in the, like if you look in like best dresses, there's so many. I mean, it uh, it still goes on. Whoever wore, yeah. you know, if they'll have two women who wore dresses, the one who wore it best is invariably the skinnier one. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Everybody should again, you know, check this out. I mean, it, it, as much as you may think you know about Gilda Radner, this documentary is like a fresh perspective and she just seems so timelessly fresh in her story and in her humor than ever i mean there's no date in this uh, any oh, no. any any no i mean i realized like that. that everybody i we were talking before we walked over like who do we think is actually oh right inherited her mantle the most naturally and yeah. i have to say i actually think it's will ferrell yeah really yeah, i know that sounds, oh, that's so funny it's that so i know really that sounds good. really weird it's, but like i mean obviously women like amy poehler or molly shannon and i mean everyone's been influenced by gilda in some capacity but actually that level of extreme intelligence and zeal because mm-hmm. gilda would go for it right and her yeah. performances i mean you just talk about ambition you can see it in this amazing no self-conscious guileless right it's like there's no subconscious yeah. it's super conscious and that's like will ferrell you yeah. know so interesting yeah, he would do anything 
Because people ask me, and I, I, I struggle to, because there's little pieces of everything. Yeah. Everybody, like a Kate McKinnon has something a little bit like Gilda. There's the way she'll about, do characters so fully. Yeah, and also the way she's sort of connecting with the audience. Like somehow it looks like she's looking sometimes. Like Gilda has this sort of like. Winking at the audience yeah, a little bit. Yeah, there's sort of a connection. <laughs> like she does in the Gary Shandling show, yeah. almost yeah. very literally. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but um, Will Ferrell, that's a good one. Yeah, because he's, first of all, you use the term guileless. And, um, la- and earlier today we t- said lack of menace. There's a, 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 a there's a, a no one, malice. There's a child. Yeah, there's no malice a child, in either of them. There's a childlike quality to them both. They share. I would agree with that. And, and that is and, and lack of, of self consciousness. I say that's just. They just remind me of kids imitating grown ups. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> Look at yeah. I mean they that's, they do a beautiful job of that. What did you think of their of her relationship with Gene Wilder by the end of this project? Because I went back and forth just from watching your doc. Well, he's just a a carbon copy of G. Smith. Who are you? (laughs) I don't know what I'm saying. (laughs) Totally, it's she. He's such a jump in the relief. You're obsessed with G. Smith. I just want to throw that out there. Well, I met him. Like also, I said he was a total dick to me. (laughs) Gene Wilder was nice. He was really nice. I'm editing myself. You know, you hear mixed things. About yeah. relationships. And you never know what a relationship is really like unless you're inside a relationship. True. I just know from Gilda's point of view, she adored him. And she loved him. Like, he was the man for her. He was everything for her. So I I kept from her point of view about their relationship. And then when I spent the day with Gene... Um, oh, you did? I did. I spent a day with Gene about a year before he died. And um, thanks to his wife, Karen. That's amazing. set it up. So, um, and he was very ill and frail at the time. And he told me these great stories. And then he told me he couldn't live with her and he couldn't live without her. You know, and I thought that's kind of like, that's such an insight into, you know, because there must have been, there's conflict in any relationship, but she just adored him. I mean, he obviously put her through the paces before he was willing to marry her. Like, it comes yeah. out in the book, and you, d- you caught some of it, too, where he basically was like, you have to do this, this, and this, and this if I'm going to marry you. And I thought, oh, brother, one of those guys. Oh, but dear. she would do anything for yeah. him. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, whether they would have stayed together or not, I don't know. I mean, they made movies together that didn't do that well, but Gilda was also writing at the time, and she had other ambitions, and maybe... She was also um, writing, because I, I have access, in, in her boxes there's stuff. So she was writing either with somebody, she was writing some kind of comeback show. Really? Yeah, called The Gilda Radner Show. Oh, I and feel so I know. Bummed. I yeah. know. And, Cheated, and, right? Yeah, and it was like... Um, Maybe it could still get done. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, there's... So this is, I don't Stupid. know. Yeah. This, I don't really... So the, she wrote a screenplay also. What was it called? It's um, uh, Spoiled Rotten. Great. And so um, uh, some people who know her are looking, somebody who, it, like, so it's being passed around. Oh, to, maybe your documentary to, will help to, move that yeah, along. Yeah, I mean, Spirit. it's, it's so Gil, and she wrote short stories. So there's a, there's a lot of other things that I think will come out of, That's great. of this. Mm. Um, so I think, I don't know, she might have, done her own show she would have done a screenplay she was not going to sit there and i think right. just be gene's wife and and well, do movies with him i think part of that period was more. she part of that period was she was also trying to be before she learned she had was uh, had ovarian cancer was that she was trying to get pregnant she really really wanted to be a mom and so yeah. it, it does explain some of the domestication version uh, you know domesticated version of her where it may appear to some that she was being maybe what you're getting at, I don't know, is that maybe there was some controlling nature to the relationship, the dynamic. But she, but um, I don't know. I don't know. It's she a different very, era too. And Gilda always, right. everyone, if you talk to her, they said Gilda would. Have, she was very maternal to everybody. She was a very, she took care of everybody, yeah. and she would have been the most amazing mother. And that's really comes out in in all the interviews. How much she wanted a baby. Right. Yep. How much she wanted a family. Oh, that's uh, again, it's uh, Love Gilda opens uh, in at 50 cities around the country nationwide uh, September 21st. Go see this. Bring your friends and family members uh, on opening weekend. Thanks to Magnolia Pictures, correct? The distributor. And CNN Films. And CNN Films. That's right. Uh, so I assume it'll eventually be on uh, broadcast. Mm-hmm. That's good. 
I think we're winding down. Did you have any more? There's, no, there, I mean, I could like, honestly talk of to you. I yeah. feel bad. I could pick your brain on this so topic. So ask me one more thing. Um, <laughs> okay, I am curious if you think that she would have ever hit a point where she found her footing as a film actress. Because it's crazy to me how amazing her stage and TV work was. And everything she ever did on screen was just mediocre at best. She, I never saw Gilda in any of those roles. Well, I think two things. I think she never had a part that was right for her. Right. Um, but I also think that she needed an audience. She loved that she was interacting with. Yeah, like Saturday mm. Night Live was an audience Live. on Broadway. She had an audience. Live. Even talk City. shows, she was genius because yeah. of that. Yeah, right. and so I think that that was even back in the days of um, Godspell. There was sort of an audience participation in sure. everything. I think she needed that, that feedback energy. and yeah. that energy. Sure. That I don't know, um, Lorraine Newman. Was uh, somebody had asked her that question, and she's like, "Some people just, you know, the film isn't for them." So, um, yeah, I don't. There's I something a little too that. static about film for her, maybe. Yeah, and doing the same thing over and over yeah. in a row, and and um, but maybe if it was the right part for her, yeah. like she was, they were trying to get her to be olive oil in the Popeye movie. <laughs> with, Robert, um, Robert Altman's Robin film. Robin Williams. Well, mm. She would have been a great olive oil. She I been, think they so the right great. One, but they did cast that one perfectly well. Well, physically, yeah. anyway. Yeah, yeah. I mean, okay. Shelley Duvall's kind of a. <clears throat> A blank We're not trashing Shelley Duvall on my show. Just saying. Just you saying. can just edit that part out, mister. <laughs> no, no. Um, Lisa Diopolito, thank you very much. This is it's great finally getting oh, thank together you. with you. Uh, thank you for having me, and this has been a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, I, I wouldn't have missed this opportunity for the world. And thank you, Lisa Rossman. This my is great. Pleasure. We'll do it again. I'm going to write all about this on my blog. I'm so excited. <laughs> oh, good. Well, well, we'll connect to your blog on the show notes. Good. All right. Well, We'll do this again, Lisa. Uh, you know, with uh, in the future with some other hopefully project of yours. Okay. All right. That sounds good. If you hear of anything with an um, amazing person who has some kind of archival stuff sitting away. Totally. Absolutely. I'm sure there's so many like great performers whose stuff is sitting in storage oh, somewhere. Oh, Sure. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. You don't.